Hello. Hello, hello. Can you hear me and can you see me? I hope you can. Let's see. Good. So I'm getting the information that you can hear me and you can see me so we can get started with this. I will set up here so I can see the chat. Um, hello, welcome. I'm very sad that I cannot be in Iceland today. I cannot see you but I hope you are seeing me well. Uh, my webcam is not the best, but well, <laughs> I hope I'm not too pixelated. I will not be in the screen for long. I will share, go to the presentation and, and in a moment. But first, I want to introduce myself. I'm Marcia Vishalva. I'm the developer advocate for AWS in the Nordics. So I'm so sorry I cannot be in Iceland today where I should be giving this talk. And instead, well, I'm doing it virtually on, on YouTube. Luckily, technology exists and allows us to do this. So yeah, they're saying that I hope you focus on serverless and I will. <laughs> so today what will happen, I will give you the reInvent recap. And first, I if you don't know my channel, you're new here, I welcome you to subscribe. This is a channel where I post weekly videos on serverless and cloud. So it's quite a, there's over 200 videos right now. So it's quite a lot of free content that you can play off and do whatever you want. And yeah, so today what will happen, I will talk about the Rainband launches. They will not be all of them because there were like 200 or something. And I don't want to be here for the whole night, but I will do like a selection of my favorite launches, but I will cover a broad category, not only serverless. I will spend a lot of time on it, but I will cover also compute, storage, analytics, databases, machine learning, artificial intelligence, containers. I will talk a little bit about the launches. I will pick my favorite ones or the ones that I find the most interesting. And I joined AWS four months ago. I'm quite an expert on serverless, but there are some things I'm still not 100% confident on, but I will still talk about them and I will present them to you. And if you have questions that I don't know the answer, I will be happy to come back to you with the answers later on and, and try to help you out. But yeah, there is a chat. Uh, you can see it in the side and feel free to ask questions and I will go a little bit and then look at the chat and try to uh, respond there. So this can be as interactive as possible. Also, if you're not in Iceland and you're somewhere around the world, you're also welcome to ask questions and to participate in this live stream. I'm super excited to be doing this and yeah. So do I have to say something else? I don't think so. So I think we are right on time to get started with the presentation. It will be around one hour, one hour and a half, depending if there is a lot of questions or if I drink too much coffee before this presentation. So let's go to the PowerPoint. Uh, I will check the chat before if there is something. No. Good. <laughs> Nothing that I should be aware of, so let's go to slides. Hop. So yes, so I already introduced myself, so I can skip this one. Uh, I want to do a shout out for everybody that is watching this in the Nordics to the community day Nordics. It's happening at the end of this month in Stockholm. We had uh, two years ago in Helsinki, last year in Copenhagen, and this year is the third time that we are having community days in the Nordics. It's a full day event of talks led by the community, totally free, so you just need to get a ticket. And it's a free ticket, so just get it and enjoy the full day of events in 
the Community Day. This year is happening in Nordics, uh, in Stockholm, and next year, let's see where it happens. And if you are not in the Nordics, check in the AWS webpage, you will find all the Community Days that will be happening around you. So I have my water bottle here because I will be doing a lot of talking and I need to get some water. So if I will be in the meetup, I will ask you how many of you went to reinvent sometime, but I cannot see that. So <laughs> I have to imagine that maybe you, most of you have never been in reinvent and it's in my opinion, one of the best conferences that they are out there. And if you have a chance to go to one conference, this is definitely the one is very different from any other conference because there is these two sides of the event. There is the educational part that is super intense. There is uh, talks from nine from Monday to nine in the night, all day talks, super experts talking there. But then there is the other part that is the community building part. There is so many events, so many parties, so many activities to mingle and to nerd out and to have so much fun. For me, uh, I arrived so tired after rain bent of all the talks, all the events, all the people I meet, all the parties uh, that I, uh, I need to take two days off after this event. Oh, so they're telling me that around 20 people here, so five have gone to reinvent. So that's quite a nice, nice number that there is in, uh, in Iceland right now that went to reinvent. So yeah, so this is the page where you can find all the announcements because as I said, I will not cover all the announcements. I will cover just uh, some of them. So if you want to find all the announcements, go to this page. And if you want to find more information about some announcements that I talk about and I don't go into details, all the announcements have uh, links to blog posts and to the documentation. So there you will find everything. So this year Rainbent has 60,000 attendees and uh, Helsinki is not that big and the city I'm from is not that big. So this is kind of like the size of two or three neighborhoods or more. I don't know, it's huge. When you go there, there's half of the people in Vegas are from, from Rainbent. So it's a crazy experience. I was there last year and there was 55,000 and this year there's 10,000 more. So it's, it's amazing. And there were over 3,000 sessions in Rainbow this year. And again, there is sessions from level 100 for beginners in all kinds of topics to deep dives, level 400, that you go into the core of the service, you understand everything. And the talks are given by the people that are creating these services. So it's quite, quite amazing to, to be there. But if you could not go there, don't worry, There is most of the breakout sessions are already on YouTube. So you can go to the AWS YouTube channel and you can uh, check the sessions there. After this stream is over, I will put in the description box of this video a lot of links that I will be making reference today. So for example, the YouTube channel from AWS will be there. So these are the topics for today. As you see, it's quite long, uh, but I will not spend hours in each of the topics. Maybe on serverless, I will spend the longest and in machine learning, but we will go through all these topics and I will try to take some water and breathe in between because it's quite a long list. So yeah, fasten your seatbelts and get ready. So let's start with compute. In the compute category, there are many launches about instances and new chips, and I will not talk about those because, well, you can find them online. I want to talk about a really cool launch. There is some comment. Oh, they're asking questions about the levels. What you mean by see people's levels? About the talk levels. Are you meaning so the talks goes from 100 to 400 100 meaning uh, that is a basic talk and 400 that is a deep dive and this is kind of a general thing for most of conference so you can find this level system online there is the description on exactly what it means and in most of the aws uh, conference there is also a description on what this uh, level means and it's basically, if you're a beginner on the topic, you will go for a, for a hundred or a 200. And then the more advanced you are, you go to a 400 deep dive. Good. So let's move on then to 
compute. So the first topic I want to talk is bracket. So Amazon Bracket for me is that type of service, like it was the uh, satellite uh, space thingy last year, I don't remember the name, but you basically were able to control your satellite launcher and you were getting that fully managed. And for me, this is the same type of thing. It's that type of launch when they announce it in reInvent, your brain explodes, poof. This is uh, quantum computing, fully managed quantum computing. I don't know, I heard this in university about quantum computing, but I never saw a quantum computer, so I was super excited when this was announced. So basically this is more targeted to scientists or developers that know how to do quantum computing. And the idea is that uh, you are able to create experiments and run these quantum algorithms and test them in these quantum machines and they are fully managed so you don't need to worry about them you can just deploy your algorithms there and see how they work and you can also run uh, this in parallel with like classical algorithms and see how these both perform so this is very interesting launch and if you're in the scientific uh, area you might find this very very interesting the next launch, I think this one is more uh, kind of coming to earth to all of us, that is Compute Optimizer. And I think this is something that if you're using EC2s or Auto Scaling Group for EC2, is something that you really need to look at. So basically here you will have a machine learning power recommendation engine to tell you if you're using your optimal um, type of instance. So for example, this is a screenshot on you have in the top line here the current uh, instance type with the CPU, the memory, the storage and everything. And this is the, the price on demand. And there under you can see all the options that this algorithm is suggesting you. And you can see how uh, in each of the options the utilization is impacted if you change the um, the type. So this is a great way to save some money if you're using EC2 to fine tune the right type of instance for your workload. The next one is saving plans. So if you've been using AWS for a while, I'm sure you know what is reserve instances. So reserve instances is more or less the same as saving plans, but for EC2. So basically you were able to reserve the amount of compute for your instance for one to three years. And the more in advance you kind of uh, save this amount, reserve these instances, the cheaper it will get. Now we get the same thing, same idea for ECS, Fargate, and soon for Lambda. So this is a great way to save some money with your serverless compute and your containers compute. So basically you can basically get lower rate the longer you reserve the compute from one to three years. So it's up to 72% of savings. So this is pretty, pretty amazing save savings. So this is something that was missing in the serverless space and in the container space and now is here. Uh, by the way, in here, in most of the slides, you will see learning more and you will find the code for the Rainbow talk. So if you search for this in YouTube, you will be able to find this talk and you can deep dive on this uh, topic that I'm just going into two seconds in here. The next topic I want to talk about compute is support for EKS for Fargate. So Fargate is a great way to run your container workload. It's a serverless way, so you don't need to manage clusters. You just put your images there and poof, it happens. But until now, Fargate only support ECS. That was the container uh, framework that AWS provided. However, Kubernetes workloads are very used in AWS and a lot of people were asking for support for Fargate for Kubernetes. So now there is support for Kubernetes for Fargate so you can have totally serverless, fully managed Fargate with Kubernetes. And that's it's kind of amazing if you're using uh, Fargate. There is a question. So the saving plans, there is a question, can you explain with examples the savings plans? So basically you will need to say, I will uh, use X amount of hours of Lambda execution in the next year, and you have the option to pay it uh, 
upfront or you can pay it later. And the more you pay upfront, the cheaper it will be. So you need to use that amount of compute hours basically because they are already bought. And in general, this I imagine works as reserve instances that when you have reserve instances, you always buy like the core computing amount of reserve instances that you know you will have that traffic and then the peaks and that is managed with just the, the instance that you buy on the moment. And I imagine you can uh, plan the same for your serverless workload that the core of your serverless workload you have prepaid so you enjoy the savings and for the peaks and the changes you can uh, basically enjoy the, the benefits of serverless. So last topic in compute that doesn't have anything to do with compute because I didn't know where to put it and <laughs> I put it here because I want to mention it on the beginning of the presentation is this cool uh, launch that is kind of answering a lot of questions that people have about Amazon. How you maintain the speed, how you deliver, how you manage operations, how you engineer at scale, how, how you manage all these amazing platform with two pizza team people. It's crazy. So to solve that problem, Amazon has released the builders library. So the Amazon builders library is a library where there is articles that you can read and they're written by Amazon senior technical executives and engineers. There is real work um, learnings there and it looks something like this. So when you go to the library, you can browse through categories. For now, there is like 20 articles or something like that. and and there you can see uh, the architecture category or the operations category and you can read the different articles that are explaining different cases and again here is the level system again you have the high level intermediate or deep dive levels for the articles as well and if you click on an article you're able to to check all the the information it's usually focused on aws and some of the articles have examples um, that you can uh, copy paste into code or they have architectures that you can implement. So it's pretty amazing for reading in the next weekend, why not? <laughs> so let's do a, a short break for water because I'm dying already and talk about storage. And please, if you have any questions, go and write them in the chat. There is a little bit delay on from the moment I read the question and the moment I answer, well, the moment I answer the question and you hear the answer because there is like 30 seconds delay, I think with the, with the stream. So don't panic, I'm, I'm reading everything. So let's talk about storage. In storage, there were many, many launches. There was a day that was pre-invent about the storage day um, but I will only talk about one launch from storage. You can go and check all the blog posts in the Rainband page. So I will talk about access points and the S3 access points. So if you're familiar with S3, that's one of the most used services, so maybe you are. If you're using objects or buckets in different um, applications, you have to write the access into one uh, policy. So how all these applications access these, uh, these files or this bucket into the policy of the document. And that becomes very, very tedious because then uh, in some point you want to remove an application and you want to change the access rights for that application. So then you need to go to that huge policy document and start looking for uh, where you need to do the changes. And that leads to a lot of bugs and errors and leave some open doors that you don't want to leave. So now with access points, it will, when you create an access point to a bucket, you can create as many as you need. And there it will create a URL for you and it will, you can attach policies to that access point. So you can connect an access point to an application and give the right access to the bucket through that access point. So then if you have to change that application uh, permissions later on, you can just go to the access point and see smaller policy that you can understand and you can do changes. And in the future, if you need to remove it, you will be able to, to remove it as well. So this uh, I took from the access point documentation, so you can, you can read it there as well. 
So yeah, that's about access points. Now let's move to databases and analytics. And I think this has quite a lot of interesting launches. So the first one I want to cover is Amazon Manage Apache Cassandra service. That's a long thing to say, <laughs> but this is basically a fully managed uh, Apache Cassandra as we have a uh, document DB that is fully managed Mongo. We have Aurora, we have RDS, we have Dynamo and we have Neptune and many other databases. AWS likes the idea of the freedom of database that you can basically use the database that you want, not the database that we impose to you. So we try to have a very big selection of databases for you to choose. And Cassandra is one that is pretty widely used and also it's pretty hard to manage if you have to deploy the clusters and maintain them. So now with this fully managed Cassandra, you are able to just put your data there. You don't need to manage server, so you don't need to scale it. It just perform on scale as most of all of our database services and it's secure and available all the time. So if you want to know more about Cassandra, I recommend you to check the overview for Amazon uh, Managed Apache Cassandra service in the Rainbend talk. They go through a lot of these uh, concepts. They take 45 minutes to explain everything. And I think if you are using Cassandra in your uh, production nowadays, this can be a great move to simplify your operational life. So this launch is something that blew my mind. I really excited about this launch. Another mouthful, Amazon Aurora Machine Learning Integration. And the idea here is that you can integrate your Amazon Aurora database with uh, Comprehend and SageMaker. So Comprehend is the um, service from artificial intelligence that AWS provides that it can analyze the sentiment on uh, text and SageMaker is our uh, machine learning service by default, it's the best service for getting started with machine learning or if you're an expert on machine learning, you can model, you can deploy, you can train, you can debug and monitor and do all the life cycle of your machine learning applications on SageMaker. If you never use SageMaker, I recommend you a YouTube channel from the uh, evangelist, from the developer advocate, Julien. He has a YouTube channel where he explains a lot of things with SageMaker. He's the machine learning specialist, so he's the best person to tell you everything. I will leave you a link for his YouTube channel in the description as well. So the idea here is to uh, grab uh, results from Aurora and combine them directly with uh, the machine learning to avoid to call an application in the middle that will need to uh, retrieve the data, read the data, analyze the data, and do all kinds of things that only adds latency and complexity. So let's look at a couple of examples so this becomes more clear. So let's look first at an example with Comprehend. So here we have a simple table that has different uh, comments. So this could be like the comments on a YouTube channel, on a video. This is very useful, thank you, awesome, I'm waiting for this. This is interesting, please add more details, it's very neutral and I don't like this. Yeah. So this is our table values. So we put them in the table and then we can do a select command from that table applying two functions that are coming now in the integration of Aurora. AWS Comprehend Detect Sentiment and AWS Comprehend Detect Sentiment Confidence. So this will return the first one, the sentiment, if it's positive, negative or neutral. And the second function will return us what is the confidence of this result. If it's 0, 9, it's very high confidence. If 0, 1 is like, eh, I'm just guessing. And this returns something like this. So you have the comments and then you can see the sentiment and the confidence. And this happens automatically with a select from Aurora. So no need to put an application, no need to do any kind of read from the database somewhere else. Everything comes from the select. So it's quite amazing. And this can be very useful for all sorts of things. But if you think this is too simple, let's do an example with SageMaker. And this is, everything you can do with SageMaker. So let's look at this example. Here uh, we have a table that has these uh, columns and this is a teleoperator example. So you are a customer 
from a teleoperator. This teleoperator keeps all the tracks of the customer, uh, how many calls they do a day, how much they charge, how many minutes they speak, blah, blah, blah. And what they want to know is when a customer will churn. So they will go to StageMaker, this teleoperator, and they will write a churn model. A churn model is available from the marketplace, so if you don't know how to write it, you can just go to the SageMaker marketplace and get a churn model. Basically, churn means when a customer will drop from your service, if it's in a game, when it will stop playing, and if in a teleoperator service, when it will change the company. So this churn model, you need to write it, you need to deploy it, and then when you deploy it in SageMaker, you will get an endpoint. Good. So now we can come back to Aurora and you will create a function that we'll call will churn and you will pass all this information that is in this table. That is what this algorithm needs to know in order if the customer will churn. And then you need to invoke this endpoint that you just got the URL from. And just as simple as this, you can start using this uh, function. So if you want to use the function, basically you can um, apply directly on the customer table and see what happened. So we will get this table that is here that has all the information from the customers and at the end we will have a flag that says if it will churn or not. In this case, everybody will stay with us. Yeah, we are the best teleoperator in the world, but we could do a filter for truth. And then when we find the customers that will churn, we can start calling them and offer them the perfect deal. So they never leave us. So let's move to RDS proxy. So this is a feature that if you are doing serverless with RDS, you will love. So let's go and talk a little bit about history. So RDS is the relational database service from AWS. It was built many years ago and it was designed mostly when we have instances that we have put names on them, we take care of them. They were like our pets, those instances. We have a finite number of those instances and we attach the instance to the RDS with a connection and we open the connection and the instance was not closing the connection every five seconds. It was keeping it open, it was managing, and everybody was happy. What happened? Serverless came and people still have the data in RDS, so they want to access the data. But if you connect uh, functions to RDS, now you have this ephemeral compute. Compute will come, do open the connection, do something and close it. Open the connection, close it, and uh, and in some point we might even have a thousand functions opening connections and closing. And an RDS is not designed for that. It cannot support so many open connections at the same time. So a lot of you were already limiting the concurrency of your function or doing some hacks or using some libraries in between the function and RDS to keep everything on track. But luckily now RDS proxy is here and it will help us and make our life easier. So basically the proxy will sit between your RDS database and the client application. So now the proxy will be in charge of managing the connections in an efficient way. It will keep the scaling up and down and it will keep the closing and opening of the connections. So if you have a client application that is already connected to an RDS, you have to do two things. First one, go to the, your RDS database and create a proxy. When you create a proxy, you will get an endpoint. So then go to your client application and change the endpoint from your RDS database into this uh, proxy endpoint and it should work. So yeah, this is, I think a lot of people were needing this. So let's move to Elasticsearch now to a little bit of analytics. So Elasticsearch is a great service that is used for reading um, different, for in general, logs. So people store logs there and then they want to analyze them. The problem with Elasticsearch is that you cannot really store a lot of data and access it very fast. But now with the ultra one tier, you can store 10 petabytes of data in one cluster. And that's quite impressive. So you can put all your logs there and be able to read them. 
and it will cost you one tenth of the cost of any other storage tiers that are around. So this is a great way to achieve cost savings and to store a lot of data and also to enjoy the Elasticsearch service. If you want to know more about managing logs and log analytics, this talk that is mentioned here will help you out and they will also go over the ultra warm, ultra warm for Amazon Elasticsearch. So you can learn way more there, but I think this is a really cool service for for analytics. I need water. So we have the next feature that was announced that is Amazon Redshift Data Lake Export. So this feature is quite cool. What it allows you is to export your data lake that is in Redshift into S3 in the format of Apache Parquet. So Apache Parquet is a very uh, condensed format, so it's very compressed and also it's a columnar format, so it's pretty easy to query from other services. So you can put this uh, export into S3 and then you can analyze it with services like EMR. I'm very bad with this word EMR, Amazon EMR, Elastic Map Reduce, uh, Athena, SageMaker and others that can understand Parquet. And then finally, in the analytics category, I want to talk about the data exchange. That is a service that allows, uh, gives the benefit for the subscribers and the provider. So it's like a marketplace for data. So there you will be able to, as a subscriber, find data, like any kind, any kind of data that, for example, it can be medical data, geographical data, I don't know, how many fishing rods are sold in the US in the last year? There is that data, go for, look for it. And all kind of things, and everything is in one place, in one format, and you can basically, uh, the data comes uh, from free to paid, you can pay once or you can pay monthly, there is all kind of subscriptions, and everything will come to your AWS bill. So when a provider updates new data, you get a notification, you can go and do things with the data. For providers, it's a great way to reach a lot of customers and to publish this data in a simple format. And as well, they have the AWS billing in place so they can manage that easier as well. Whew. So we are in the security and networking around one third of the presentation. So yeah, we are going good. <laughs> so let's start with CloudTrail Insights. So I hope everybody that you are sitting there have CloudTrail enabled in your AWS account. If you don't, go and enable it. I cannot see you if you stand up and you leave the room running. I will not get offended, but it's very important. CloudTrail will log all the activity in your AWS account and it's quite cool. If something goes wrong, you can use it to figure it out. And CloudTrail's Insights is a great tool for identifying unusual activity in your AWS account. Because CloudTrail is very, uh, it has all the activity in your AWS account, so it's very noisy. And with Insights, it helps you to filter out the noise to find unexpected things that are going on and same time uh, going around the log. So it's a pretty cool uh, launch. And definitely, if you're interested in this, if you are managing operations, go and check this Rainbow talk. So now let's move to another security launch and this is Detective. So the idea here is that it, uh, this service will help you to organize your data. So in general, when you are looking for information inside AWS, you have your CloudTrail, you have your VPC logs, you have all kinds of logs all around the application. And with Detective, it, if there is a problem or something, it will grow all the logs together and then it will make graph for you, make nice visualizations and it will help you to understand what is going on in your account. And more about security and I think this one is uh, also pretty neat and you can go and enable it right now. And this is a way to analyze all 
um, the things that are connecting to the outside of your AWS account. So you can see if you have any holes that somebody can come into. So the IAM analyzer, access analyzer will check your buckets, your KMS keys, your uh, access control, your roles, everything. And there you will see when you enable this, it will run for the first time, it will analyze everything and it will show you, okay, you have this thing and this thing, you have a bucket that is open to everybody and you can decide this is something intentional, I have made it on purpose or this is something that uh, I was not sure, I don't know if I might want to remove it because it's something that was left behind in the past and I don't want it anymore and it helps you to make that bucket private again and it helps you with everything, with all the steps. And this access analyzer is running all the time after you enable it, so if something uh, changes in the future, it will uh, let you know. By the way, some of the screens you will see this QR code in the side. This is because there is another video that links to this service that explains more in detail, this uh, access analyzer for example, but you will see it in many videos. I will link all the links in the description box, but if you take a picture of the screen, this QR code will take you to the video. Moving forward. Serverless, yay! So, this is my favorite category. But this is not a serverless only uh, talk, so I have to shorten some of the serverless announcements. Uh, so, yeah. If you have any you want to see, uh, I have a whole playlist on serverless announcements in my YouTube channel, go and check it out. The first one is the provision concurrency on Lambda. So this is something that I think since Lambda was launched, people are asking for that they want to have warm Lambdas in place. At the beginning, I didn't understood why people will want to have warm lambdas, but then the more I talk with different customers, I understand that there's some use case that it makes sense. When you need to have really uh, short latency, then having a warm lambda, it's really important. And some customers have uh, functions that run once every hour or once every 10 minutes, and the function needs to be ready to perform right away. So if you don't know what a warm Lambda is, let's rewind a little bit and explain a little bit of how Lambda works. So you have the function and you deploy it to the Lambda platform. If nobody calls that function, Lambda platform keeps it for itself. The function is idle, it's not executing at all. A request comes in and triggers that function. So now the platform will deploy this function into a virtual container and this deployment is the warming up of the function. The deployment takes a little time depending on which language you're using. Java, for example, takes longer than JavaScript. If you have a very big package with a lot of libraries, again, that will take longer. So there's many reasons why uh, kind of provisioning <laughs> a Lambda will take longer time. And this process of warming up a code Lambda for the first time takes a little time. The second and further request comes already hitting a warm lambda and they respond faster. You can see these metrics in the cloud watch. You can see how many call uh, starts you have. These are the lambdas that are coming uh, without being deployed, so the deployment. So the provision concurrency on lambda, what it means is that you will decide, okay, I want 10 functions to be warm all the time, no matter what. And then when a request comes in, they will be ready to rock. Sure, you need to pay for those functions that are deployed all the time, but in some cases, this is needed by the customers. And again, you can combine this provision concurrency with auto scaling groups, so you don't need to have the lambdas provision all the time. You can decide when you want to provision them. So if you're using some, you can uh, provision these lambdas. For example, if you want to, to provision 10 lambdas to be warm, all the time, you just need to write these three lines. The first one is to have an alias for this uh, function and then just decide how many uh, provision uh, concurrent executions you will have. When you deploy this, you will see something like this. You will see in your Lambda function a new box called concurrency that you can see how many Lambdas you have in your account 
to a reserve. In my account, I have a thousand. And from here, I have reserved 10. When you're deploying this, if you have 10, it will happen very fast. But if you have 500, for example, it will take a while and you can check the status on how these uh, functions are doing. Next launch is API uh, Gateway, the new version for HTTP. So Lambda and API Gateway, they are in a love relationship since the moment that uh, API Gateway was announced with the integration for Lambda. It's a cool way to um, create serverless backends and do all these kind of things that we love to do with serverless. Just put an HTTP gateway in the front, a Lambda in the back, and voila, it scales and it works. But API Gateway has a lot of features that really almost no one uses. So the cost tend to be a little bit expensive. So now with this new version, it's a lightweight uh, HTTP API. You can reduce your cost around 67%, so that's quite a lot. And also you can reduce your latency from using the normal API gateway. So the new API gateway it was announced in Rainband, is available, still in preview. Uh, you can access it and the, the features will be launched during the whole spring. So you will see more and more features that will get a uh, feature pairing with the old API gateway. So if you want to start using this in your application, if you are using some, the only thing you need to do is in the uh, API definition, just change it from API, that is the traditional API gateway, to so just HTTP API, and then it will work. Make sure that the uh, properties you are using from API gateway, they are um, available in the new HTTP API, as again, not all the functions, all the features are available yet in API Gateway, in the new one, but you can check the documentation. If you are using the new HTTP API, you can see this new beta console that looks super nice and clean. And there you can see as you um, were navigating in the old version, the, the routes, the authorizations, the integrations, the stages, cores, and all those things. So this is something worth trying. And if you have a simple HTTP API, this might be the way uh, to go in the future. Or if not, wait a couple of months until more features come and adopt it. Another one of my favorite, favorite, favorite launches is the Step Function Express workflow. So Step Functions were launched like four years ago. So Lambda was launched five years ago. The next year was Step Functions launched. And when I heard about Step Functions, I was like, wow, this is amazing. You can orchestrate your functions using Step Functions. So Usually how I like to build my functions is I like to build them to do one thing and one thing only, very small. But the problem if I need to make some application out of it, I need to either orchestrate it or uh, coordinate it somehow. And Step Functions was a great tool for that. The problem that Step Functions was not meant to be used this way. So it had some faults that didn't work with, uh, with serverless. The first one is that didn't work for high volume uh, processing workloads. And then the second one is that they were charging you in every state change. So that was kind of annoying if you have 20 lambdas to do one thing. Again, step function is a great service for doing long running workflows because step functions are uh, live for one year. So you can add manual works, you can connect it to all kinds of services. So it's amazing for that. And it's also amazing for, for serverless. So now they launched these express workflows that are perfect. They are uh, designed for ephemeral computing. So maximum five minutes of duration for the workflow and you don't need more. And then it supports 100,000 events per second. So it's great for high volume event uh, when you have a lot of different uh, events and high throughput. So if you go to the console, basically you just uh, create a step function as before. And there, the only thing basically you need to do is to say that it's an express and make sure that you are using the right uh, types of events because, well, there is uh, some things that are not available in the express because, well, you don't have time for manual approvals, for example. But 
When you deploy it, it looks exactly the same as a next step function. You can see the monitoring, the login, and as well, you can um, see later on in this uh, short video, the, the definition that is the state machine. It uses exactly the same uh, state machine language that the step functions, the traditional ones use. So if you're familiar with the step functions and you're using it for serverless, this is a great switch for, uh, for your application. So definitely explore this. There is a video with examples on how to do step functions uh, express. So go and check it that one or then check the blog post that they announced this feature. Good. So another launch that I'm very, very excited is EventBridge. So EventBridge is a service that was announced on uh, July last year. So it's a pretty new event and it's great for uh, decoupling all your services. So basically EventBridge is able to listen to events and then you define rules and depending on the rules, then is forwarding those events to different places. So it's a great way to decouple. So if you're working in a big company and everybody is doing lambdas, for example, you can put event bridge in the middle and everybody is sending events to the event bridge and then everybody's reading from them. So you don't need to talk. But the problem uh, before this uh, schema registry is that, well, you needed to talk because there was no way to know the schema before uh, using it. And now they enable the schema registry and the schema discovery. So they're asking a question here about the, um, sorry that I switch topic, but they just asked a question about the express. So the question is why to cap at five minutes? What if you're running a function that takes longer than five minutes, for example, a big query on a database? So if you're running longer functions, functions can run for 15 minutes, then you need to use the other step functions, the traditional ones. These are meant for ephemeral work, work uh, workflows, I can say that word. So you need to use um, the traditional uh, step functions. I can talk, I can talk. So. If you're running longer workflows, traditional step functions, if you're running ephemeral workflows where you are using lambdas that are just doing one thing and one thing only, the express. Good, you got it. So let's go back to event bridge before everybody forgets what I was talking about. So I was explaining the service, how it's good. It sits in the middle between uh, two different things. It can be a lambda, it can be a queue, it can be any service. So the event bridge registry and discovery now allows you to add a schemas to the registry. So if you have this company again, where everybody's writing into the event bridge, now you don't need to talk, you enable discovery and then uh, event bridge will start reading all the, doc the uh, events that are coming inside it and writing it in a catalog in the registry. And then you can go to the registry and look at all the events, all the schemas and see how they are, uh, how they are. So let's look at the console. So in here you can see this is the, the event bus, the default one. And I have enabled the schema discovery, so it's on. So if I go to the schemas in the schema registry, here you can see all the schemas, all the ones that are in the schema registry. And then you can see these are the AWS schemas that sometimes we don't know them and we want to, to check them out. So we can find, now we can see the schemas. So that's pretty powerful. And these are the schemas that were discovered. So this one is an event I just put in the event bus. And when you open it, you can see the, the schema and you can download the code bindings for Java or TypeScript and I don't know for other languages. So it's pretty cool and there you can start using that schema. If you want to see the whole tutorial on that, there is a video for that as well. Another um, serverless announcement, this was a pre reinvent announcement, I think, or it was on the first day of serverless. I don't know, but I'm very, very excited about this one, so I put it anyhow here. So this one is another way to decouple your applications. So 
before Lambda destinations, what you have to do. If you want to, uh, from a Lambda, send a message to a queue or to another Lambda or to a band bridge, you will have to write that inside the code of your application. So you will need to go, I don't know, in the handler and say, on success, send this message to a band bridge. And then on failure, send this message to, I don't know, dead queue letter. Now with Lambda destinations, that logic is uh, put in the operational part of your Lambda. So it's put in the infrastructure and you can uh, define that as, as CloudFormation, for example. So you will define on the destination on the success and on the failure, you have to pass an ARN and you can pass SNS, SQS, EventBridge and Lambda. So it's pretty powerful. So how it looks, this is um, um, exports the handler file for a function, super simple. And on event success, basically it just called the callback, nothing. And then on failure, it just called the callback and froze an error. That's kind of it. And then on uh, my infrastructure for this uh, project, I will define two functions because I will use them. And then on my function, I will add this event invoke config. That is the one that will uh, manage the traffic. So this is all with uh, some and cloud formation. So you will define in which function you want to apply these uh, destinations and you will say, okay, I want to pass it the success to the success function and the failure to the failure function. You can put here the uh, Amazon resource name ARN, I horrible saying that, uh, to a queue, to an SNS, to um, event bridge. So it's pretty cool. They're asking me about uh, Lex not having support for cloud formation. <laughs> That's kind of a question I, I, I'm not answering right now. <laughs> so yeah, let's move on to the crazy part or well, I don't know if it's the crazy part, but I think this is pretty amazing part of the, the launches that is extending AWS outside of what we are used to, that is the region, so to the edges. So the first one is the support for IoT Greengrass for containers. So before you were able to deploy Lambda functions on the Greengrass and now you can put Docker containers there. So it's pretty cool. You can use the same ones that you are using in your AWS account into uh, the Greengrass. So it's amazing. And this one is something I was amazed, but so many people ask me questions about this thing. I'm not a premise person, but when I saw it, I was like, wow, this is crazy. So this is a fully managed service that extends AWS infrastructure, yes, infrastructure into the customer side. So basically you're getting a huge box with AWS infrastructure that you can plug into your data center. So it's a way to have hybrid experience, to have hybrid cloud. And the twist here is that you will have the AWS infrastructure and all the services that are inside that infrastructure are managed by AWS. So you don't have to touch that box. That box works by itself and it's uh, magic. You just plug it and everything happens. So you, when you plug it, you will see it as an extension on a region. You will see their uh, part in the, in the closest region that you're using and you can manage it from there. If you have any problems, you can call AWS, AWS will help you to fix all the problems and if you need to move data back and forth, again, AWS will help you with everything. So the box looks like this, it's like a refrigerator, it's very big and you can get all the refrigerator full of um, capacity or you can buy half of it or you can get a quarter of it. So somebody is asking why somebody will get this refrigerator? Well, the reason why people are interested in it, and I think that it's amazing, is that you can reduce the latency. Because if you have this box on premise, then you don't have latency almost. You're inside your same uh, network. So if you have to do processing of things that require really fast execution, this is amazing. You are not going to the internet. Everything stays on your network. So that's one of the main reasons why customers are interested in this. And um, yeah, so let's see what are the uses that people 
find to this box in the future because one thing is what AWS thinks that people will do with this and the other thing is what people do with this thing. So it's just, they're saying if it's because of law. Well, it can be, again, S3 is yet not supported by this box, but it will happen in the future. You can see here all the uh, services that are supported. So S3 is coming in the future. So maybe if you can put all your files there, then <laughs> you can uh, do some workarounds with the law. I'm not a law expert, so I really don't know. But I think this is opening a lot of new playing around with AWS and solving a lot of uh, problems that customers are having. And, and this is something that as most of the things in AWS comes from customers request. So now we have S, uh, EC2, EBS, ECS, EKS, M, uh, EMR, I cannot say that, BBC, RDS is coming in preview and S3 is coming soon. So those are the services basically that you can get from the refrigerator and I imagine more services are coming uh, later on. So another of the uh, extending region launches is the local zones. So local zones are not regions, are not availability zones. They are like um, extension of the cloud closer to the users to keep ultra low latency. So this is having, uh, we are launching one local zone now in Los Angeles to support the media and entertainment. So they have to do a lot of rendering of video and they have to send huge files over the internet. So being close by helps out a lot to, uh, with the latency. So it's not a full uh, region, it's just a piece of AWS infrastructure. So it doesn't have all the benefits that a region has. Are, and so it's something in between. <laughs> Let's see how this develops and which ones comes in the future. And I think this is the last one on the uh, extending your, um, your AWS from your region, that is the wavelength. And I think this one is amazing launch. I was so confused when they launched it. And then when I understood it, I was like, wow. So basically it's adding AWS compute and storage in the 5G networks. So now if this happens, the edge is the 5G network. So instead of having the edge as a AWS uh, cloud front that is all around the world, then this will be everywhere, super close to you. All the customers, they are very close to their antennas. And, and I think that enables developers to deliver applications with super small latency. And uh, for making this happen, AWS partnered with some uh, telco providers, Verizon, Vodafone, and these other two, and they will start uh, implementing this wavelength in their 5G networks. And then I don't know yet how mobile developers will access this uh, compute and storage, but I think it's something we will see uh, later on and how this developed, but I think this is extremely powerful to be able to be so close to your customers. Phew. <laughs> we are a little bit over the middle now and I'm tired, but this is very exciting part and uh, I want to continue. Uh, yeah, so. But don't worry, this will not take one hour. It will take maybe 15, 20 minutes because there's a lot of slides that I will just go through because I'm not an expert on machine learning. So I will try not to bluff you a lot. So the first thing I want to introduce you is the machine learning stack from AWS. So there is three layers on, uh, well, they're asking for a five minute break. So I agree with that. So let's do a five minute break and we can come back to the uh, presentation at in five minutes. Ah, uh, somebody was waiting for this. Well, you have to get a glass of water and come back in five minutes.
Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. So let's continue. Are you around? I hope you are. And you stretch a little bit your legs. No, they're shouting. <laughs> well, we need to continue. If not, we will never finish. There is uh, the last bit of the presentation. So again, this uh, is the AWS recap. So we are going to talk now about machine learning and artificial intelligence services that were announced in Rainbow. So let's do a little bit. Um, let's do a little bit of uh, exploring on what is the machine learning stack look like. So. There is three layers in the machine learning stack from AWS. You have the uh, framework and infrastructure that is the bottom layer where there are the frameworks and the infrastructure, the different chips, different instances, the different uh, machines and everything. If you're a super pro machine learning uh, developer, you will take so much advantage of this by creating uh, everything from scratch and working on it. If you are an expert as well, but you like to uh, get free from managing the operations on the machine learning uh, machines, you can use SageMaker that is in the middle uh, tier, that is the machine learning services. SageMaker is a great service uh, for experts as well for newbies on machine learning. It will help you to train, write your models, deploy them, test them, monitor them, all the life cycle of your models. And then in the top tier, we will have the IR services, the artificial intelligence services. There are these services that you really don't need to be an expert on machine learning. They do one or two things, but they do it extremely well. And basically you can use these services by calling an API. And there is many of them and many of them has been announced now in Rainband. So I will first talk about the artificial intelligence services and then we will go to the new features of SageMaker. So let's start with the artificial intelligence services. So the first one is the Amazon Transcribe Medical. So Amazon Transcribe has been uh, around for a while. Basically what it does, it listens to audio and writes it down. So it's a simple service, but it's very useful. It can be used to create subtitles for videos or it can be used for transcribing podcasts or any kind of audio. If I use transcribe with my YouTube content in channel, it gives weird uh, results because it doesn't have the uh, knowledge on technical vocabulary. So it works quite well, but then some words like serverless, it's like, uh, I don't know. And you can see that with many captions sometimes when you have these auto-generated captions in videos that they are, uh, they are not very accurate. But for medical purposes, it's very important that the uh, transcription is accurate and it's on point. So Amazon Transcribe Medical has all the vocabulary that needs to understand medical uh, audio and put it into paper. I cannot share audio with you because I don't know how to configure it for the stream. I need to dig into that for next uh, streams if I'm going to do this. But basically in here what is happening, somebody is speaking this text that is in the black box and then uh, Transcribe is writing it down in the, um, in the screen. So the text is extremely the same that uh, the one that the person is saying. Uh, Transcribe understands all the words and all the terms. So that's super important. Another service that has been around for a while is recognition and recognition is a great service. Basically, it allows you to recognize things that are in images and in video. It can tell you about people. If you have celebrities, it will tell you if there are celebrities. If you have uh, furniture, animals, landscapes, sentiments, it will tell you a lot of things. 
Um, the thing with uh, recognition is that before this feature you could not teach or train the model and now you can add labels to different images to train the, manage the, to train the model in a fully managed way. So for example, in this uh, image that we can see here, there is this very specific car parts, I think, uh, turbocharger, torque converter, alternator and spark plugs that you can put labels on these images. You train the model with many, many images of the same thing. And then when this uh, thing appear in the picture, then recognition will say, hey, I know this. And it looks something like this. You can grab a box and then you say, what is the label for that thing? You need to do it many times because you're training the machine learning model and it's good to use images from different angles and different perspectives. So then uh, recognition can learn. So this makes recognition extremely powerful. The next thing I want to talk about is um, how in general when we are doing some workflows usually we need to choose if one want machine learning to do it or then we want humans to do it and now aws launched this service where humans and machines can work together it's called the amazon augmented ai so a2i very hard to say a2i <laughs> and and basically, this service allows you to implement human reviews when machine learning doesn't have enough accuracy. So how the workflow works, you have this application that sends data. The machine learning service will uh, use the custom machine learning models and will make the predictions. You can use recognition, text track, and all those things return a confidence uh, how good the result is. If there is high confidence in those predictions, then you will get them immediately, the response, everything is happy, happy, joy, joy. If there is low confidence because the image is blurry, because the text is not that clear, then this will go to human review. Humans will review it and put the result in S3 for later. So basically for using human workforces, you have like three options. You can use the Amazon Mechanical Turk. That is a service that is available 24 seven and it has half a million uh, independent contractors that work there and can perform all kinds of tasks. Or then you can use in-house workers that comes from uh, yourself or contractors that are very specialized in that particular thing or I don't know. Or you can use vendors. AWS has in the marketplace a long list of vendors that can provide this human review. How this looks? Something like this. You have in the side instructions that um, the human reviewer will need to, to follow and then they have a question and they need to select an option. So in this way then the, the humans can answer the low confidence issues and for example this is for documents this is um, something with a uh, transcribe i imagine or text track sorry that basically is ocr using artificial intelligence so another thing that is kind of hard using uh in general is fraud detection so fraud detection in some cases a lot of companies tend to not do it at all because they waste more money trying to implement their fraud detection than to uh, on what people are stealing. Uh, also, you can use machine learning for doing fraud detection. You can hire people and maintain the models and manage the models. And your uh, scientists always need to be on top of the attackers all the time. And it's quite hard as well. So there is this new service called Fraud Detector, and this is a service that is fully managed and it's real time and it works at scale. So it's pretty cool. The idea here is you are at rules. So particular for your use cases, you can add rules and then Fraud Detector will analyze all the data that is coming in. And if things apply, then it will uh, let you know that there is fraud. For example, here there is fraud. There is no match, it's approved, and so on. Fraud detector comes with a lot of uh, pre-built models. A lot of these models are built from uh, Amazon.com, 
experience on uh, fighting fraud. So it's not something that somebody got out of the hat. Amazon.com has a lot of experience working with fraud detection because it's a huge platform that and is using this uh, technology for detecting fraud in different parts of the of the platform. So this is really cool. And also, if you have something very specific that you want to have your own models, you can integrate it with SageMaker and you can build your own things and, and extend this fraud detection. Another service that is using machine learning to make our life easier is this one that solves this problem that is called uh, Code Guru. So basically the problem is that uh, we have different uh, stages in the application development process. We write the application, we review the application, we build it, we test it, we deploy it, and then we measure it. And in each of these steps, we need people to review that everything is going fine. We need to have code analyzer, we need to have experts to make sure that there is everything is optimized and everything is in good condition. A lot of Companies already have this in place. They have a lot of experienced developers. They have a lot of experience on cloud. They have a lot of people working so they can do code reviews and they can spend time analyzing and improving the performance of the applications. But a lot of companies have very small personnel. They don't have enough headcount to do all this performance improvement all the time. And they might not even have the cloud experience to understand what they can do better. So Code Guru is a service that will help you uh, with machine learning to improve your application development. It has two parts, the reviewer and the profiler. The reviewer works in the code review part and the profiler works when you are deploying and when you are uh, in production. So basically the reviewer, how it works, it, when the developer puts um, the code in the repository, it makes a um, pull request, then Code Guru will start extracting things from that code and matching it with similar uh, applications. It's uh, trained with open source uh, projects, so it's learning from what is out there. And then it will show recommendations for the developer. So it can look something like this. There is this, this code and then uh, Code Guru recommends that uh, something else. So don't wait because it's doing a thread sleep. This is very bad, we all know that. So Code Guru recommends that you need to do this other thing and you can see more documentation in here. And if you implement it, for example, in Git, it looks very friendly for the developer and uh, the pull request is created and Code Guru can uh, put a comment there. Okay, there is this problem, you know, you're using this and this is the fix and you can find more information here. And this is an example. And this is a great way uh, for, for developers to, to improve the code. So somebody is asking if Code Guru is similar to Sonar. So Sonar is a profiler. Uh, it has some features similar to Sonar, I think, but I don't think Sonar is so uh, wide. I don't think it talks on your, I don't know, I have not been using it for a long time, but I don't know if it talks to your pull request and I don't know if it has uh, cloud performance optimizations because this is what we will see next when we talk about the profiler on how you can improve your application for the cloud. So in the profiler, this happens in the moment that the application is running in the, in the production. Code Guru is profiling all the time and it's using previous uh, runs of the application and other applications that it has seen run in its previous life, what it was trained with, and it's doing some button matching. And also it has some knowledge on how the cloud should work and what are the best practices. So then it will see you will see in your console different ways that you can improve your code. So you can see uh, different ways that you can improve it. For example, here is an efficient cryptographic implementation, but you can also see different ways that you can uh, take advantages of the cloud or you can do things different if you're using the cloud. Another uh, cool service that so somebody says Sonar Cube does exactly the same. Well, it's possible. This is just integrated in your AWS account. So yeah, so this is another example of uh, something that takes a lot of time. So if you work in, um, in an enterprise, you know how hard it is to find information. 
So we are so familiar to our search tools in the internet that we can put anything and the right result always appears in the top. But when we are in an enterprise, we try to do the same and we never find what we are looking for. So there is Kendra. Kendra is a new service that is uh, targeted for enterprise. And this uh, helps you to uh, do search in enterprise. So it will index all your different um, whatever data sources you have, and then you can do um, natural language queries on it, and it will learn from the domain and the feedback, and it will have natural language understanding. So it's like a internet search in your enterprise, everything we are used to. So for example, you can type what is Amazon Kendra, and then you will have the suggested answer here that it has the answer of that question and then you will have all the links to the different articles this is something we are very familiar to see in our internet search nowadays these are all the different connectors that work with kendra more are coming out so this is uh, something very enterprisey like salesforce sharepoint all kind of exchange dropbox box whatever amazon s3 you know jira confluence so everything can be indexed into Kendra. So the first step is to create an index where you will put all your data sources and sh sync it. And then you will get uh, either the Kendra service, you can deploy it right away, or then you can integrate it in your existing services. It will give you some code snippets that you can try. And it can look something like this. For example, when is rain bent? And it can tell you the answer. And it will learn if somebody is always clicking in this first one, then it will learn that this is the right answer. So next it can be answering uh, other things. So then you can look for amazon.com employee discount, for example, and you can see again the information and you can categorize it. So it's, it's something, um, something that we are very familiar with that sounds sometimes very funny when you work in enterprise and you don't have that. So let's move to the last bit of this presentation that is the machine learning services. And this is all about SageMaker and the launches on SageMaker. So the biggest launch was the SageMaker Studio and all the other launches I will be talking about are happening inside the studio because before you have all these notebooks that you they were all around and now machine learning developers have a full integrated development environment that they can do all the machine learning work they can manage their experiments the model the training the deployment the monitoring everything can happen inside the machine learning studio so this is a huge announcement for machine learning developers so the studio looks like this uh, you can see your notebooks in the side, you can see different graphs, like for example, if you are doing some experiments, and then you can have all kind of different things depending on what you're doing. We will go into some of the new features for the studio and for SageMaker in general. The first one is the uh, SageMaker notebooks. So this is a new way to uh, have fully managed notebooks. They're uh, easier to create, easy to share, and you don't need to do any kind of weird setup. You just create a notebook because that's at the end what the machine learning developer wants to do. They don't want to do computing resources. They don't need to worry about that. So now everything is fully managed by SageMaker. So basically you just can create a notebook, as simple as new notebook and poof, it creates it and then you can share it and it will create the Git repo for you and everything. So something that we are very familiar in traditional IDEs. The next one is the SageMaker processing. Again, this is something that it makes uh, fully manage the analytics shows for data processing and model evaluation. So this is making life easier for the machine learning developers so they don't need to manage compute. They can just uh, use the containers, the SageMaker built in containers and run their um, the SageMaker models there and poof. This one is pretty cool, it's a uh, SageMaker experiment. Again, it's built in, in the studio and here you can uh, have a simpler way to organize, track and evaluate training experiments. What happened before is that the developers will have this in Excel sheets or in 20 different notebooks all around the world. And now you can have everything in one kind of project 
where you are checking which is the most efficient uh, model. You can see different visualizations depending on the different experiments and you can see which one perform better. You can iterate, you can deploy the right one and, and, and it's very, very simple for the developers to see. So it looks something like this. You have different experiments here and this is a chart on the performance of the experiments, I imagine. So it's quite, quite, quite nice for the machine learning developers. Next one is the SageMaker debugger. And this is again another thing that makes machine learning developers' life easier is to debug and analyze uh, models that are live. So as you will do with code, that you will go around and step into it and see what is going on here. You can uh, analyze and debug the model with no code changes. You can start seeing if there are some errors and everything like that. So it looks something like that. You can start uh, looking in the notebook and you can see how, how this uh, debugging is, is affecting, depending on the variables that are coming in, what is going on. I'm not a machine learning expert, so I will leave you uh, Julian SageMaker YouTube channel in the description box because he talks about all these new launches in depth and how to use them. And definitely you should check them out if you're a machine learning expert. The next one is the SageMaker model monitor. And this one is again, another tool for helping machine learning developers. These launches are all for making life of the machine learning developers easier to monitor their uh, models on production. So when things are in production, how those models are performing, how they're doing, do we need to change them? Because sometimes the models go obsolete and they need to uh, be improved. So everything can be seen in this monitoring tool. And the last one, and this is the launch for me <laughs> because I'm very new on machine learning, is the autopilot. And this may be very, very excited. And this is a tool for doing machine learning without knowing anything. So basically what we'll do, you need, the only thing you need is data. So you will import from S3 a lot of data and then autopilot will pick 15 different uh, models for you. They will train them. And then you will be, uh, and it will pick the best one with the best results. It will tell you which one is the most optimal or the recommended one for your model. And, and you can pick that one, deploy that one, and poof, you have machine learning working. So this is something I will definitely try next year, this year, because it's, it blew my mind when I saw this. It's like totally done for you. Uh, I like this. And it looks, again, uh, it's in the SageMaker studio, so, so yeah. So again, this is a summary of the SageMaker. The ones in red are the new things. So we have the SageMaker studio, and now we have the notebooks, the debugger, the experiments, the monitoring, and the autopilot. So this makes it an end-to-end -end solution for building machine learning applications from the moment you are picking your models to building your models, to picking your frameworks, to then trying, training, debugging, optimizing, experimenting, then deploying, monitoring, hosting, and then everything. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. The last two things I want to show you are the new toys. So we have the DeepRacer improvement. So if you have seen, there is DeepRacer. Uh, now there is the new one, Evo. And it has two eyes. I call it evil. I thought that was his name because it looks very evil with these two little eyes looking at you. Uh, but it's called evil. And it has object detection because now it has two eyes. And then you can perform head-to-head -head racing. So you can create your own races online and compete with your colleagues and train for the summit because in all the summits, we will be giving uh, tickets to Rainband for the winners of the races. So it's a great way to go to reinvent for free. So start training your cars. You can do everything from the AWS console without owning the car. And then when you go to Summit, you can uh, borrow one of the cars from there. And the toy that was announced in uh, Rainband to uh, show in the family of toys, we have the deep camera, the deep lens, the uh, deep racer, and now we have the deep composer. I was planning to take my deep composer to Iceland and show you an amazing song. The only song I know how to play that is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but I, I cannot connect audio and um, everything here. So 
you have to trust me this is fun and you can also use the deep composer without having the physical device it's available on the aws console so it's in preview uh, so basically what you do there is to you play a tune to to do to do to and then you pick a model it can be a pre-trained model like rock and roll jazz or you can create your own you can be very creative and you pick a model so for example if i pick a symphonica and i talk my little piano tee -tee 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 -tee, then when i uh, compose music using that model then it will create a full orchestra based on my music so i will play twinkle twinkle little star with no rhythm and then i will put it in this pre-trained model of symphonica and i will get a full orchestra playing horrible music for me if you're good at music this can be very fun because there is quite nice results that i have seen around if you're like me this is very terrible and it's very very fun again <laughs> because you can see how the machine learning does things with with your music <laughs> so it's, it's a very fun activity to play on the weekend and also with kids i definitely recommend it it's very fun <laughs> yeah and i think hour and a half yay i'm done i am happy to answer questions i might not know the answers but i can chat with you for a while if you want and yeah i put my face now so you can see me uh yeah so if you have any questions let me know So they're asking if I saw something interesting on the AWS IoT. Uh, I only mentioned one thing in the IoT spectrum, that is the green grass for containers. That was for me the most exciting thing. But if you are an IoT developer, again, I uh, recommend you to go to the Rain, Rain Band Recap. And I think there you can browse for categories and you will find the IoT launches. For me, the most exciting was that. But I'm pretty sure if you're using that at work, you'll find many other things exciting. They say Deep Composer is still in preview. So if it's in preview, you can ask for a preview request. Uh, there is usually a form that you can fill in and you put your information there and somebody will give you access later on. So it's something that, uh, that, that you need to fill in because it's a new service and we like to take feedback from our customers and yeah. So if you want to access the uh, composer, just fill in the form for the preview and eventually you will get access to it. Do you have other questions? But yeah, but I hope uh, you enjoy this and the video will be available for you uh, after I finish the stream, when I publish this, it will be available for you. So you can watch it later, you can uh, go to the uh, description box and you can find all the links I will populate them in a while when when I get a second I will put all the links there that I mentioned during the the presentation so you can basically click on those and find all the information that I, I mentioned I really recommend you to check Julian uh, YouTube channel he has amazing content on SageMaker and he's an expert on that so if you are a SageMaker expert definitely go and check his content so there is no more questions, so thank you very much. I'm so sad I could not be in Iceland. I hope I can be in spring there when there's no snowstorms, making my flights impossible. So thank you, thank you, and I see you around. Bye-bye.